England's squad is filled with young talent. There's Declan Rice, Mason Mount, Marcus Rashford, Phil Foden, Rhys James and even Jude Bellingham could all arguably put a case forward for a starting role. On the other end of the spectrum, Kyle Walker, Kieran Trippier and Jordan Henderson make up the only likely squad options who are perhaps beyond their peak years. But Henderson might struggle for fitness and Trippier faces tough competitions from the already mentioned Rhys James and Kyle Walker is playing some of the best football of his career under Pep Guardiola. As written on Total Football Analysis, this tactical analysis looks at the players likely to feature for Southgate as well as his overall tactics and how the manager is likely to use the players. We'll create the tactic in Football Manager, simulate the Euros and see how well England will do. So quickly before we kick things off, make sure you check out the Euros magazine on the Total Football Analysis website, the link will be in the description. Also make sure you like this video, if this video does get a lot of likes then that will allow me to use more articles and make more videos just like this. But now let's get started. Southgate likes to play a back three, but he has seamlessly begun to move away from this. Most recently, it appears that Southgate is preferring a 4-3-3 or a 4-2-3-1, flipping between playing with a single pivot and a double pivot. Either way, it seems highly likely that a midfield three will involve Rice. Mason Mount is also likely to start, then with that third position, there is a lot of competition. Calvin Phillips has performed in that role in recent internationals, whilst, if fit, it's likely Henderson would warrant a start in midfield. It might seem like somewhat of a push with the Dortmund midfielder still only 17 years old. However, there's an argument to be made that Bellingham is England's most natural number 8. Ahead of this midfield three, England will operate with a front three. The one position that will be certain is Harry Kane starting as the centre forward. Either side of Kane, Foden would appear to have played himself into the starting 11 given his club form. As for the other position, it's difficult to predict. Sterling has been a strong performer for England and is experienced at international level, but a dip in club form may cost him a start in berth, whilst Grealish was widely regarded as the Premier League's player of the season until his injury. Again, this could cost him a start. Rashford on the other hand has been consistent this season and given his form and lack of injuries, he may well still a start on the right side of the front three. At the back, Maguire and Stone seem set to start as the centre-back pairing, with Kyle Walker at right-back despite strong competition from James. As for the left-back position, it's a toss-up between Chilwell and Shaw, but I expect the Manchester United man to nick it. The full-back pairings and even the overall formation may well change based on the opponent. Against an opponent sitting deep in a low block, we could well see Southgate opt for Trippier and Chilwell giving these full-backs the licence to pepper the box with crosses. Finally, in goal, Jordan Pickford went through a very public questioning of his ability at the beginning of the season, however, he has performed admirably since. His strong distribution skills will also prove to be helpful for Southgate's side and this should see him keep his place. England are a patient side, playing with little directness and therefore, unsurprisingly, play with few forward passes per 100. Southgate's side are far from partial to a long ball, but yet despite this lack of directness, they are an incredible efficient attacking side. Declan Rice is growing as a ball player and not just a defensive midfielder who can break up play. The West Ham midfielder provides Southgate with the flexibility to allow England to play in a 4-3-3 with a single pivot. From this shape, Rice will sit deep as the single pivot during the build-up play, allowing the fullbacks to push on and giving England something very similar in possession with a back four to what they look like with a back three. We can see this from the following pass map from England's most recent game against Albania. It's well known that Kane likes to drop into midfield at any given time and by leaving two in the midfield during the build-up, it provides more space for him to do this and plenty of different passing angles from the back three and fullbacks to find the front man. In the image, we can see how he remains central as England build up out wide, with a sequence of quick interchanges and rotations involving the left back, left winger and central midfielder. We can see how Foden drops in to exchange passes with Shaw, drawing the Albania's right back forward. Calvin Phillips then rotates into the space created by Foden's run and England can advance play down the left flank. England will use their attacking talent in wide areas to build up and even when the opponents don't get pulled forward, the attacking wide players have the pace to latch onto through balls even with little space behind. We can see in the following image how Sterling is being man marked as Shaw receives the ball on the left flank. He makes a simple dummy move inside just to ensure his defender moves forward on the front foot before then spinning in behind for the through pass. With England being a side that dominates possession, they naturally spend less time out of possession than other teams will. With this style of play, England will most commonly face sides looking to beat them with quick, direct counter-attacks. 
Cutting these attacks out at the source is vital and England's recoveries in the final third is strong, suggesting they press well and turn over possession when the opponent has the ball inside their own third. If operating with a single pivot, expect that holding player to be flanked closely by two number eights positioned in front of him. However, with a double pivot, they will remain compact while still providing pressure when the ball is in the half space. We can also see how the left winger tucks inside, with the right winger and centre forward preventing any easy passage out of pressure for the Belgian side. England will keep their front three narrow, pressing the ball and showing the opponent out wide. They are supported by the central midfielders pushing forward to ensure that if the front three are beaten, there won't be any space in the centre of the pitch for them. Rice's ability to cover ground well and break up players so effectively gives England's midfield and front three more freedom to press aggressively. Should they be beaten, Rice steps forward from his deep position to intercept the ball. Starting with transition to attack, England will often look to keep possession and begin their patient build up from the back. However, Kane has the abilities as a target man on transition and England will also look to hit him on transitions. With the pace of England's wide play as a constant threat, the likes of Foden and Sterling will look to run past Kane and latch onto a knockdown before continuing the fast break. As for transition into defence, England counter press well, using two basic structures to facilitate this. Firstly, if the ball is lost over a short distance, it will be immediately pressed by the player who gave up possession. This immediate pressure forces the opponent to move the ball quickly, perhaps before their teammates have transitioned into space to receive the ball and play out. As such, this can force a quick turnover or at least encourage the opponent to merely clear the lines with a long forward ball. However, England also structures their counter press during the possession phase. In advanced attacks, Southgate's side will have plenty of passing options in close proximity to the ball. This allows them to combine in tight spaces and advance possession, but it also allows them to quickly swarm the ball upon losing it and quickly overload the opposition. And with that, that wraps up this tactical analysis. Make sure you check out the magazine. It's a fantastic magazine and also the link will be in the description. But for now, we're going to head over to Football Manager. We're going to have a look at the tactic and also Football Manager's prediction of how England could do in Euros. So let's head over to Football Manager. So here we have RDF's England's Euro 2020 prediction tactic. It should be predicted tactic, not prediction tactic. But anyway, it's a 4-3-3. So we're going to quickly go on to skim through the team instructions, the player roles and instructions. Then we're going to look at the results and see how well England did in Euros. So for the mentality, we are on positive. The attacking width is set to fairly narrow. So hoping the players are going to be in close proximity, also helping for our press. For the approach play, we are playing out from the defence. Also, focus play down the left and down the right because that is where England will focus down when building up. The passing directness is set to shorter because England are a possession-based side. And for the tempo, we have just left that on standard, giving us flexibility to either slow down the tempo or play with a quicker tempo. In the final third, the dribbling, the creative freedom we have no instructions with transition when the possession has been lost of course we are going to counter press and when the possession has been won we will hold our shape looking to build up patiently out of possession we have a higher line of engagement trying to win the ball back in the opposition's final third alongside that we have a higher defense line and the offside trap the defensive width is set to narrow so we are going to be forcing the opponents outside also again getting our players positioned close to each other for the present intensity we are set to more urgent and also prevent the short goalkeeper distribution for the player roles and instructions in goal we do have the sweeper keeper who will be taking more risk at left wing back we have a wing back under attacking duty he's going to be passing it shorter and taking fewer risk you will see why but just in case you don't i'm using take fewer risk because other players have taken more risk and for a possession base side I think is vital to balance out the risk taken in the passing. So the left wing back he's passing it shorter and taking fewer risk. In centre back we have two ball playing defenders they will be taking more risk. At right wing back we have a wing back on automatic duty and he is also taking more risks. In defensive midfield we have a half back taking more risk as well. This is mostly where Declan Rice will be playing so I'm just gonna switch the predicted squad here. So I filled the squad straight away. You would notice that there's no Jordan Henderson and there's no Phil Foden, unfortunately, in Football Manager, and they could not be with the squad. But in defensive midfield for the halfback, this is where Rice would be playing. He will be taking more risk being a ball playing defensive midfielder instead of one just looking to break down play. He is going to be closing down more as well, tackling harder and marking tighter. Of course, if the press is beaten further ahead, I still want Declan Rice pushing forward and winning the ball back. 
In central midfield, we have a Mazala on the left side, which would be Mason Mount taking more risk. And on the right side to him is a box-to-box -box midfielder. He too is going to be used as someone that's going to be balancing the risk when it comes to passing. So I have him passing shorter and not taking any risks. On the left side of the attacking trio, we have an inverted winger who will be sitting narrow. And on the right side, we have an inside forward. He too will be sitting narrow. Up top, lastly, we have a complete forward, someone that's looking to drop into space, possibly running out the defence, but also taking long shots. I feel this role suits Kane perfectly. So this is the tactic that I have created for England. It's a predicted tactic. It's not going to be the exact thing, of course. The Euros hasn't started yet, but now we are going to check the results from the simulation and how well England done in the Euros. So let's check the results. So in the group stages, Group D, England topped that group. We played three, we won two, we drew one and lost none. Those two wins came against Poland, 1-0 victory and Kosovo, we beat 5-0. The draw is of course against Belgium, that was 2-2. We scored eight goals in group stages, only conceding two goals. In the second round, we drew Germany, beating them 3-0, which is very, very impressive. They had 10 shots to our 14. They had four shots on target to our five. We had the better XG. Germany had most of the possession, but you can see quite clearly, England were the better team on the day, winning 3-0, which is impressive. Harry Maguire, Rhys James and Jadon Sancho grabbing the goals. So that took us to the quarterfinals where we drew Portugal, winning 4-0 then. Again, another big win, another impressive win as well. This time, we were clearly the better team by far and we were both impressive going forward and on the ball. As we can see, the passes completed, 92% of our passes completed, giving us an average possession of 64%. We had 17 shots at goal, raking up an expected goals of 2.82. The goal scorers of this game, again, was Harry Maguire, Jadon Sancho again as well. Marcus Rashford this time scoring his goal. Harry Kane didn't start this game. Calvert-Lewin, of course, came on and got his goal. Reese James here as well, played a nine. So this is a big tournament for Reese James. He's currently had two very good games that, that we've seen anyway against Germany and Portugal. Two very good teams and Reese James is performing absolutely fantastic at right back. So that took us to the semi-finals where Ukraine played Spain and Sweden had England. But unfortunately, this was the end of the road for England. This is where we got knocked out. And this is probably the stage you wouldn't have thought that we got knocked out given the team that we drew. We beat Portugal, we beat Germany, we drew with Belgium. So three very good teams without a loss. We came against Sweden and we lost 1-0. No disrespect to Sweden, by the way. No disrespect. But we lost 1-0 to Sweden. Sweden did play a 4-4-2, which is interesting. So that might be something to look out for. In this match, we kind of were the better side, but Sweden had a better XG at the end of the game. We had 13 shots, only getting three on target. Sweden had eight shots, getting four on target. We had most of the ball. We had a better pass completed ratio, but at the end of the day, that didn't matter because Ishak thought it was a good idea to knock England out. That there was the end of the road for England, but in the final, Spain won. Spain beat Sweden 2-1 in the final, which was played at Wembley. So that's a huge disappointment that we didn't get to go to the final and play in our backyard. But in the tournament, England scored the most goals. We came 8 for points per game with 1.17 for the most shots. Spain had the most shots. Fewer shots against, we wasn't in the top 8 for the best pass completion ratio. We came 3rd with 89%, which is good for our possession based side. For the average possession, we came in 2nd as well. Germany had 60%, we had 56 For the most tackles won, we came in 3rd with 112 For the most dribbles made, we came in 3rd with 23 we had the most clean sheets throughout the whole tournament and for the fewest conceded we were also joined first for the top goal scorer alexandra ishak with eight goals we have no players in the top eight unfortunately but for the assist and like i said it must have been a big tournament for reese james and it was he's joined top assist with four assists as well for the most shots Jaden sancho surprisingly with 19 you would have thought harry kane actually but Jaden sancho was there for the most man of the match awards reese james is there so absolutely big tournament for reese james and we can see here for the crosses completed per 90 as well reese james with 22.98 crosses per 90. For the most key passes, Reese James is there with 26. For the best pass completion, we don't have any players there. 
for the best pass completion, for the most tackles won, and for the most dribbles, we don't have any players in the top eight. But for the most clean sheets, we have Henderson. So they opted not to play Jordan Pickford and went with Dean Henderson instead. And for the fewest conceded, Dean Henderson is their joint third or joint fourth, sorry, with three conceded. Unfortunately, though, that wraps up this tactical analysis and football manager simulation. I hope you guys have enjoyed it. Spain were the eventual winners. England got knocked out in the semis, but still, semi-finals is not a bad result. It's not the worst result. We got knocked out by Sweden. You would have thought we could have done better given that we got Sweden in the semi-finals, but it just wasn't to be. If you like this video, make sure you give this video a like. That there is very important so I can carry on doing these videos. And also make sure you check out the magazine. The link will be in the description. The magazine is fantastic. You're going to get a lot of in-depth analysis. Absolutely brilliant. But that's the end of this video. I'll see you soon. Stay safe. Peace out.